Okay. Okay, take it thanks, away, Peter. Uh, thanks, Chris, for your uh, kind introduction. Um, so what matters in MLAI um, is summarized uh, in this table, what we find through discussions with uh, many uh, MLAI customers, and that's uh, ultra-high I.O. density. We heard that before, terabit per second per millimeter class uh, I.O.s. Ultra-low latency, so uh, much less than a nanosecond add-on over passive copper, passive copper being sort of the state of the art. Um, Ultra-low power, and uh, for high-speed interfaces, less than six picojoules all in is um, pretty low power. And then um, a, an architecture that allows you to use the same interface from intra-rack all the way to inter-row, and then wrap around even um, in these wrapped around architectures where you can easily have hundreds of meters um, of link distance. So interfaces that satisfy that, we call them HDIO for high density IO, and um, our engine is an HDIO interface. So if you look at what ASICs can provide, what host interfaces can do, they can do one of two things. Either they have die-to-die -die interfaces, bunch of wires or UCIE, which only go over like two millimeters of substrate trace and have a density of between 500 gigabits per millimeter up to five terabits per uh, second per millimeter for the uh, most dense UCIE um, uh, variant. Or you use 30s, you go high speed, and then you get between 500 gigabits per second per millimeter to a terabit per second per millimeter, and you can typically bridge uh, channels of 25 to 36 dB of uh, electrical loss. Now, copper cable, uh, now you need to get that data out of the, uh, out of the package uh, to the next um, board. In order to do that, you can use copper, but copper only has 40 gig uh, per millimeter to say 150 gig per millimeter today, and uh, only reaches one to two meters. So it both isn't matched to the IO density that you want from the ASIC, and it only has a very, very limited reach. So what you could do is go uh, regular CPO, which couples the fiber in the plane. It couples at the edge of the chip, and, um, and that can go over hundreds of meters to maybe kilometers, but it only gets you 80 gigabit per second per millimeter to maybe a few hundred, uh, maybe 150, 250 gigabit per second per millimeter. And what that means is you have this fan out on the trace, uh, on, the, on the substrate. You have to fan out because you can't match the density of the ASIC. So those fan out traces will uh, lead to losses. And um, in order to increase the density, you would have to use WD, uh, WDM, which counter to what we are hearing in some talks is, is a terrible option for the data center. Um, for various reasons, including complexity, uh, power consumption, and cost. So um, what we propose here is um, a two-dimensional optical HDIO where we couple the fiber not at the edge of the chip, but like in the last talk, we, coupled, you, we use the surface of the chip to couple optics uh, into fiber. And um, that's shown here. So we use these uh, two-dimensional arrays coupling to the top of the, of the ASIC. And because we have that vertical array, we can also um, place our interfaces in multiple rows or multiple rings around the ASIC. So we can use a 2D dial tiling to um, uh, get very high uh, interface um, densities up to multi terabits per second per millimeter. Now, in terms of power and latency, there is only one uh, catch phrase here, optics must look like copper. You need to build optics that looks to the host surges like a copper cable. If you do that, you get huge gains. And the gains you get, uh, get there is you eliminate the retimer DSP. That's typical for optical pluggables today. So if you eliminate the retimer DSP and build linear optics that can be driven directly with your uh, host surges, you reduce the power consumption by 50% of your solution, and you slash the latency by 200 nanoseconds because you avoid 100 nanoseconds in each of these optics DSPs. So how do we make optics look like copper? How do, what, what, what's that all about? This is a typical copper link from a, a transmit 30 is a PCB trace, a copper cable, a direct attached cable, for example, another PCB uh, trace and uh, receive 30s, and that's all a linear system. So what that means is your pulse that you send into your, um, uh, from your transmitter gets spread out, so you have these echoes and pulse broadening, so that's what you receive at your receiver. And what the 30s does, 
typical linear assert is it takes a fraction of this main pulse and subtracts that from the subsequent pulses to get um, to cancel out uh, the echoes. So here you get a nice uh, pulse. Now, if you uh, do that in optics, in optics the problem is that many of your optical components are not linear. So what you get is not this, but this. So your, your peak amplitude gets uh, compressed, which means that this subtraction doesn't really work anymore. This linear subtraction and you get unequalized garbage here that uh, really messes up your SNR and, and degrades your bit error rate. So what you need to do is make your optics linear. All these nonlinear impairments, amplitude variations, time skews that are typical of optics, you want to reduce them to a minimum and that's what we do. So this is an eye, a typical eye of our um, XT1600 product that shows very, very nice, no skew, very nice linear um, uh, level spacing, just like copper. So we make optics look like copper to enable regular 30s to drive it. And that's what our uh, engine looks like. So we have a silicon photonics die that uh, inco uh, incorporates 16 transmitters and 16 receivers. And on top of that, we have octal drivers and TIAs flip chipped. And then we have a two dimensional uh, array of fibers, uh, in our case, three by 12. So that's 16 transmit fibers, 16 receive fibers, and four fibers to feed external laser light in for a total of 1.6 terabits per second. And uh, with that, because we have very smart uh, drivers that have very strong equalization, we have shown that we can bridge up to 49 dB of electrical trace loss aggregate from the transmitter to the engine and from the engine back to the receiver. That's huge. That's, that's a very, very high trace loss that we can bridge with a regular MR30, so no fancy um, 30s even. And now if we, if we concatenate that, so we get 250 gigabits per second per millimeter for a single row, and then we get 500, 750, and if we do four rows, we get a terabit per second per millimeter as uh, escape bandwidth density. Now those are typical eye diagrams. That's what the module looks, the chiplet when it's packaged into a near package optic mod module. Um, and all in it consumes, uh, including the laser, about 4.9 picojoules per bit. And this looks terribly large on the screen. So this is what this really is. So this is 1.6 terabit near package optics, very, very small module. Uh, you stick that next to your MLAI ASIC, you tile it into multiple rings around the ASIC, and you get terabits per second per millimeter of, um, of escape bandwidth. That's, uh, that's the future of high density optical uh, interconnects. And uh, we are sampling this to customers now. Customers are very happy that it, it actually comes up and all the 16 channels work. That's, that's consistent feedback that we are getting, so that's apparently not typical in the industry. So, uh, so if you want to uh, test it out, uh, come see us, uh, contact us, and we'll be happy to sample it to you. Thank you. Looks like we have the first question lining up. <laughs> 9 dB uh, effective electrical trace. Why? I mean, this thing sitting right next to the chip. Where does the 49 dB come in? Yeah, so um, that depends a lot um, uh, on the architecture. So it, 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 the chiplet here, as shown, sits next to the chip. That's right. But in a near package optics module like this, you have to go through a package, right? So of course, that's not 49 dB. But then, uh, that, right? But then some of these package uh, substrates are very lossy, especially for the MLAI case where you don't have, uh, you can have very lossy substrates, and you typically don't get to those 49 dB. That's absolutely right. This was just to show that we can bridge up to that, which if you have lower traces gives you much more margin in terms of bit error rate. It, you can trade that for margin, right? The 49 dB is at 2.4 times 10 minus 4 error rate. So that's at right at the KP FEC limit. So if you have less uh, loss, you trade it for margin, you trade it for lower power. Um, this is just a, to show that this can be bridged. Okay, thanks. Next question. Uh, my question is also about the 49 dB link budget. Uh, so in order to reach this 49 dB, uh, what, what kind of service equalization are you talking about? Do you need like MLSD or no. like- this No, was, this was a very standard um, um, uh, MR thirties. It had seven taps at the, uh, seven FIR taps at the transmitter, 18 at the receiver, that's it. No DFE, no MLSE, no 
no non-linearity compensation or any fancy stuff. It was a very simple, it was one of these um, surveys that you would typically find on the host side of, a, of an optics DSP, for example, wow, speaking to the host. That's very impressive. Uh, oh, by the way, do you need the uh, auto negotiation or link training to realize this? Or um, it's not needed? So, of course, it helps you to have um, some link training. Um, there are standard settings, and with the standard settings, you won't be able to get all the way to the 49 dB, but it works. So, the link comes up with standard settings. But of course, if you have link training, if you're able to tweak either manually or uh, manually is just for the lab, but uh, with a link training algorithm, then, um, then you get better performance. And we have shown that uh, it works uh, with link training as well. I see. Thank you. Thank you. One more question on the right there. Yeah, for the optical transmission, uh, how far can you go? Can you go beyond 500 meters, like two kilometers? Yeah. Yes, yes. So this is a single mode silicon photonics interface, and um, you can reach several kilometers. We haven't done tests yet for how far we can go, but um, I mean, you should be able to reach at least two kilometers, if not more. Uh, at 500 meters or two kilometers, what kind of, what kind of a TDIQ are you seeing? So the TDIQ we are seeing is typically in the 2 dB range. Uh, that's um, sometimes a little less than that. Mm -hmm. Maybe a quick one. <laughs> um, are you also shipping into, say, OSFP modules? Like, how many tiles or uh, how many of these devices can you fit in a OSFP? So we can. Our our chip is natively 16 channels. So um, we can do an OSFP XD with 16 by 100G uh, with that. We are not currently productizing that because uh, our main market is MLAI, but um, this is one of the things we are, uh, we are very seriously looking into. Any further questions? Actually, I have one for Peter. So you showed about six picojoules per bit uh, energy efficiency, including the laser. Yep. But this is still, this is kind of your first generation. Where, where do you think you can eventually get to? Efficiency. Yeah, that, that's a good question. So um, one one thing that uh, is very interesting in the industry is that the lasers are becoming just so much more efficient. We, we were talking 5% wall plug efficiency two, three years ago. Now we are hitting 20%, which is which is cool. I mean, uh, these lasers really, uh, really, really get there. And also the fact that we use external lasers and can disaggregate them into places of the system where it's cooler, not right next to the hot ASIC, that helps, that increases the efficiency. So uh, th that, that will help lower um, the picojoules per bit. Um, obviously, we're doing our best to lower as well. Uh, I can't give you a, like a, a number, but I, I think three picojoules per bit of, of, over a reasonable roadmap time should be very well doable. Okay, thank you. Any further questions from the audience? Look like one here. Yeah, good job. This is really exciting on the density. I've, as you know, I'm really excited about all this. Is there any statement or color you can paint on um, the commercial side of the business? Is there any disruption there uh, that'll take, take place or do you have any public statement on that yet? Well, I mean, I think the MLAI clusters absolutely need that density. And this is the only way that I see to achieve that density. And we get that feedback from many AI companies we, we are talking to. So uh, density is king, even more king than power is. Uh, latency is very important, which this does, because there is no retimer inside. So um, does that sort of answer your question? <laughs> Okay, well, let's thank again Peter for his uh, great overview here.